A Chest with Two Locks, Felice Giardini and Charitable Benefits in 18th Century England. On the 25th of March, 1773, Felice Giardini politely presented his oratorio Ruth to the governors of the London Lock Hospital before announcing his imminent departure from England. The Lock Hospital Fair Committee books then report that once all necessary copying was complete, at a cost of eight pounds and twelve shillings, Ruth was to be stored alongside the other oratorios belonging to the charity in a specially commissioned chest made with two locks of different keys. It's perhaps no coincidence that Giardini's announcement came just three days after a benefit concert for newly arrived violinist Wilhelm Kramer was held in Hickford's rooms by Bach and Arbel. In fact, Simon McVeigh has suggested Kramer's arrival may have been directly behind Giardini's decision to depart. However, Charles Burney, writing in Rees Encyclopedia, published in 1819, suggests that Giardini's career as a violinist, composer and impresario had been without its former potency since 1763, the year Giardini's disastrous involvement in Italian opera at the King's Theatre came to an end. The encyclopedia reports that from this time, Giardini was always hovering over his former lyric kingdom without the power of invading it or bringing about a restoration. But he nevertheless managed to keep himself afloat until the admirable production and great performers of Germany began to form a Teutonic interest and Germanic body here. Bernie's tirade against Giardini was of course highly prejudiced, thanks in part to the embarrassment caused by the failure of their joint scheme to set up a music school at the founding hospital in 1774. Yet there is evidence that Giardini's success was waning. In addition to the arrival of a new and dangerous rival, Giardini was struggling against a rising tide of anti-foreign and anti-Italian sentiment, which cast Italians as capricious, arrogant, extravagant and devious. In many ways, Giardini fitted or perhaps even directly influenced the stereotype of Italian musicians in England. Although his patron, Mrs Fox Lane, had granted him a £200 annuity when she died in 1771, Giardini was regularly in debt. Reverend Martin Maiden, a friend of Giardini's and chaplain at the Lock Hospital, once asked him why, though you are continually receiving such large sums for your professional exertions, yet you are always poor. Giardini apparently replied, I will tell you the plain, honest truth. I candidly confess that I never in my life had five guineas in my pocket, but I had fever till they were gone. So it's unsurprising to note that Giardini found himself in court in 1758 for refusing to pay his debts to music seller and publisher John Cox. Giardini also seems to have found other dishonest ways of earning extra money to fund his so-called prodigent habits. William T. Park recalls Giardini's technique for selling poor quality violins at inflated prices. In Giardini's hands, the violins emitted a powerful tone which gentlemen purchasers were unable to recreate once they got their instrument home. We should, of course, take all these anecdotes with a pinch of salt, as most were reported by Englishmen years after they occurred. But their sheer number and relative consistency suggests that Giardini may have been suffering from anti-Italian prejudice in addition to the arrival of new competition. Yet evidence from the Lock Hospital minutes and Giardini's previous involvement in charities such as the Founding Hospital and the Fund for Decayed Musicians suggests that Donating Ruth had the potential to assist Giardini at a time when he was facing multiple challenges to his career. I will therefore contend that Giardini's donation of Ruth and the announcement of his imminent departure constituted a calculated move to help rehabilitate his career. By the 1770s, such presentations of objects to charity were fairly common, with charities receiving numerous ceremonial and functional objects, including Handel's and Hogarth's well-known contributions to the founding hospital. Handel left the score and parts of his oratorio Messiah in his will, 
and Hogarth donated several paintings, including this portrait of the founder, Thomas Coram. Despite the prevalence of these gifts, scholarship on charitable donations in the 18th century tends to focus on financial benefactions to charities. For example, Donna T. Andrews' book, Philanthropy and Police, concentrates on subscription lists, while Ilana Kraussman Ben Amos's The Culture of Giving highlights testamentary bequests. The literature that does investigate the presentation of objects to charity frequently explores the meaning and content of specific objects. See, for example, analyses of works donated by Hogarth to the Founding Hospital, rather than the motivations of the donor. One notable exception is David H. Sulkin, who explores the relationship between governors at the Founding Hospital and the artist donors who contributed works to the institution. Sulkin notes that the donations benefited both the hospital and the donors. The paintings helped to create an arena that was conducive to the exercise of benevolence, attracted actual and potential donors, and distinguished the character of the visitors from that of the objects of their charity. In return for their generosity, all artist donors were appointed to the body of hospital governors, which brought them into contact with many potential patrons. These artists also had continuous public exposure to their work, a rare occurrence in a time before public art galleries, and involvement with the charity helped to associate their profession with the promotion of the country's moral and material well-being. The idea that both the giver and receiver benefit from a gift is reminiscent of early 20th century sociologist Marcel Mauss's seminal work on gift giving. According to Mauss, the act of giving a gift builds social relationships because it creates reciprocities and obligations to the receiver to repay their debt. On presenting a gift, the giver is placed in a position of power as the receiver is now in debt to the giver. So, although the gift is apparently free and gratuitous, the giver is constrained and self-interested. Applying Mouse's work to Giardini's donation to the Locke Hospital suggests that Giardini too was placed in a position of power, that the presentation of his gift helped to strengthen the relationship between the two parties, and that he too had much to gain from his apparent generosity. This paper will therefore provide just one example of how Mauss's theories of gift giving could be applied to musical and charitable activity in 18th century Britain. Although it's difficult to say for certain who was responsible for commissioning the chest with two locks at the lock hospital, the way Ruth was stored may have given it a certain cachet. In her book, Charity and Poverty in England, Sarah Lloyd discusses a similar benefaction. Jonas Hanway's donation of an embellished bookcase to the Marine Society in memory of his brother Thomas. Hanway, who founded the society in 1756, referred to his gift as a chamber mausoleum. Lloyd proposes that limiting access to a donation enhance the status of an object. She writes that, in dictating how it should be tended and calling his gift a mausoleum, Hanway clearly tried to make it more than just a piece of furniture, converting potential extravagance into an enduring and pious commemoration. Commenting on the location of the mausoleum, Hanway stipulated that it should be kept in the charity's committee room. Lloyd continues that, that it could be only partially known to outsiders and hence the status of the object. The Locke Hospital had already set a precedent for keeping a close eye on its musical works. An earlier version of Ruth, composed by Giardini and Charles Avison, had been placed in a chest with four locks soon after its first performance in 1763. Matthew Gardner suggests that this was a deliberate act to preserve exclusive performance rights for Ruth and to prevent copies being made. Perhaps they were aware of the confusion at the founding hospital, and the governors assumed, much to Handel's disgust, that they had exclusive performance rights to Messiah. The Lock Hospital minutes record an incident in which a printer was spotted selling pirate copies of the Lock Hospital hymn books. The governors went as far as consulting a solicitor on the best course of action to take against what they regarded as infringement of their rights. 
Given his long-standing relationship with the Locke Hospital, he first came involved soon after he arrived in the country when he performed in a concert in 1752 to raise money for the institution, Giardini would no doubt have been familiar with the Locke Hospital governor's attitudes towards music ownership. In donating Ruth, Giardini must have known that the Locke Hospital would have assumed exclusive performance rights. In fact, his decision to offer Ruth and effectively hand over all performance rights nearly came back to haunt him. On the 30th of March, 1775, Giardini presented to the weekly committee a letter from a Mr. William Geyser requesting the loan of Ruth for a concert in Gloucester in September that year. Committee members clearly thought this was worth careful consideration as they referred the matter to the general court, who decided to allow the score and parts to be lent out for this event. The fact that Giardini felt the need to ask the governors if the work could be performed elsewhere further supports the claim that the Locke Hospital governors were highly protective of what they considered to be their rights over musical works. While limiting performances of a work may seem counterintuitive to a musician seeking to revise his previous fame and success, donating a work to an institution was one way for a composer to control who could access it in a world before copyright. As Lloyd suggests regarding Hanway's chamber mausoleum, limiting access to an object also enhanced the status of the gift by making it seem more special. Despite the chest and its locks, Ruth is now lost, but contemporary reports seem to suggest that, although smooth, pleasing and demonstrating thorough knowledge of good orchestral effect, the work was far from sublime. But keeping it locked away suggested that it was of great importance, or at least worth stealing. Now Ruth was safely locked away, it would theoretically only be heard once a year, which gave the annual performances a certain exclusivity that presumably helped to attract audience members and boost Giardini's reputation. However, the fact that the score and parts are now lost suggests a drawback with Giardini's tactics. If there was only one copy, there would be no backup if it ever went missing. By 1773, the annual performance of Giardini's Ruth at the Locke Hospital was already well established as it had been performed there every year since 1768. However, the presentation of the score was perhaps one way of ensuring that this tradition would continue for at least a few years after Giardini left the country. And indeed it did. The oratorio continued to be performed annually until 1780 when the hospital switched to giving charity sermons. The implicit agreement that the annual performance of Ruth would be preserved upon receipt of the score aligns with Mauss's notion that gift giving generates obligations for the receiver to repay their debt. Mauss also suggests that a gift retains the spiritual essence of the giver since it pertains to that person. So the chest with two locks could be seen as a vessel for storing Giardini's relic in the same way that Hanway's mausoleum commemorates his brother. This is particularly pertinent when viewed in conjunction with Giardini's claim that he was about to leave the country, as the gift can be interpreted as a way of preserving his essence or even memorialising him in his absence. However, Giardini's announcement that he would soon leave the country may have been a strategic move rather than true determination. Alison de Simone describes how singers organise special benefit concerts for themselves to celebrate a special occasion, such as to promote their return to the stage after a long absence, to advertise their debut, or to announce their imminent departure from town. Such statements were not only informative, but, in the case of announcing an imminent departure, also a way of making the occasion seem more exclusive as the performer would now be available for a limited time only. The lock governor seemed to have harnessed the pulling power of this style of announcement, as on the 31st of March 1773, six days after Giardini's announcement, a newspaper advertisement for the performance Ruth in the aid of the lock hospital states that Giardini would play a concerto and that it would be the last time of his performing in public during his stay in England. However, 
In subsequent advertisements for Ruth, such as two on the day of the performance, the statement about Giardini leaving the country has been removed, while the rest of the wording remains the same. Had Giardini changed his mind by this point? Or perhaps he'd never truly intended on leaving in the first place. If the latter, was the threat to leave just a publicity stunt? While attracting more people to attend the concert was clearly beneficial to the Locke Hospital, it was also useful for Giardini to promote his skills as a composer, soloist and leader. The phrase, during his stay in England, is also telling. By 1773, Giardini had been in England for over 20 years, and yet his stay implies that this was always going to be a temporary visit, and that he could disappear back to Italy or elsewhere at any time. While emphasising his transient presence perhaps plays into the hands of those who criticise the capricious nature of Italian performers, it may also have made witnessing a performance by him seem extra special. So Giardini's threat to leave the country, combined with the protection and promotion offered by the Lock Hospital and the chest with two locks, helped Giardini to fashion himself and his oratorio as rare and therefore particularly exciting. Giardini's donation to the hospital also helped him to fashion himself as a member of the elite. In becoming a donor, Giardini not only implied he had sufficient funds to be able to afford to give away all rights to an entire oratorio, but he also aligned himself with other donors to the hospital, many of whom were wealthy members of the nobility. The notion that Giardini was attempting to portray himself as a wealthy, powerful man fits with many descriptions of Giardini's character. Like many Italian musicians, he regularly toured around the grand houses of the landed gentry, teaching and performing in private concerts. Through this, he, according to Charles Burney, was engaged and caressed at most of the private concerts of the principal nobility, gentry and foreign ministers. However, rather than seeing himself as a servant, Giardini seems to have considered himself a guest. William T. Park, in his memoirs, describes one occasion when the Duke of Cumberland invited Giardini to play in a week of parties at his house in Windsor Park. When Giardini was asked to dine at the pages' table, he was apparently so offended that he left for an inn in town instead. Similarly, a satirical pamphlet published in 1777 claimed Giardini fancied himself a prince and has the assurance of claiming veneration from his betters. And Giardini was described by William Gardner as a fine-figured man, superbly dressed in green and gold, the breadth of the lace upon his coat, with the three large gold buttons on the sleeve, made a rich appearance which still glitters on my imagination. Giardini's donation of an oratorio may also have represented a conscious attempt to emulate Handel, a fellow foreigner who had managed to accumulate great wealth and fame. In fact, there are many similarities between Handel's and Giardini's musical activities, in addition to the obvious similarities between their respective donations to the Foundling and the Locke Hospitals. Like Handel, Giardini ran the annual performances of Messiah at the Foundling Hospital, managing the performances from 1768, and they were both involved in the Fund for Decayed Musicians, Giardini performed in benefit concerts for the charity from 1755. Both musicians were, somewhat ruinously, involved in the running of Italian opera at King's Theatre Haymarket, and both were preoccupied with vocal genres, especially opera and oratorio. So, so perhaps donating Ruth was just another attempt by Giardini to emulate Handel. While masquerading as a prince and comparing himself to Handel may have indicated arrogance, once again emphasising his stereotypically Italian qualities, donating Ruth to the Locke Hospital may have helped Giardini to distance himself from such accusations. The musical and religious activities of the Locke Hospital were strongly associated with the early development of the Methodist movement. For instance, the barrister, clergyman and Locke Hospital chaplain Martin Maiden, who we heard from earlier asking Giardini why he never had any money, was a close follower of John Wesley. 
he introduced whole congregation hymn singing in the chapel and also published hymn books to raise money for the institution to which Giardini contributed four works. Nicholas Tempoli's analysis of the Lock Hospital music from 1762 to 1792 concludes that a primary source of its texts and character came from Methodism. While it might initially seem strange that a presumably Catholic Giardini would have been so closely associated with the music of an institution with such close links to Methodism, forming an ever tighter relation with the Locke Hospital may have helped to counteract some of Giardini's foreignness. Furthermore, association with charity in general may have helped to neutralise Giardini's flamboyant character. Maxine Berg and Elizabeth Ager's work on the changing connotations of luxury in the 18th century notes that traditionally, luxury was considered a sign of excessive indulgence, wantonness and idleness, and was therefore gendered as feminine. The feminine gendering of luxury is explored more extensively by Michelle Cohen, who notes that excess was in total contrast to frugality, simplicity and self-discipline, which represented, according to John Barrell, the most authoritative fantasy of masculinity in 18th century Britain. These notions of excess align with the stereotypical Italian characteristics I outlined earlier and suggest that association with charity and Methodism would help to offset Giardini's foreignness and make him seem more English. Overall, Giardini's donation of Ruth and announcement of his imminent departure helped to show off his musical skills and maintain and develop a level of exclusivity while also turning down some aspects of his ostentatious personality. But did it work? Well, 1774 marked the beginning of an intense period of concert activity for Giardini and it was also the year he began leading Vento and Arnold's new and fashionable concert series at the Pantheon, suggesting that his self-interested gift may indeed have unlocked a new branch of his career.